And then I think, you know, it was probably two or three other dinners later that were like, okay, let's do this. Cheers! Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast, presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, digital marketing dude at Hippo Direct, and you can reach me at max at hippodirect.com for help using your podcast as a marketing tool. This is episode When I'm 64, and today's guests are John Troutman and Nate Schroeder from Empathy Wines. You may be familiar with their third co-founder, Gary Vaynerchuk, a.k.a. the one and only Gary V. You'll hear how John and Nate went from being Gary's right-hand men at VaynerMedia to being his fellow co-founders and partners in crime at Empathy Wines. You'll also hear how they're completely disrupting the wine industry by selling wine directly from the farmers to the consumers and providing great-tasting wine for 20 bucks or less. And we have video. Yes, thank you, Jake from Empathy and formerly Elvis Duran, for capturing it all on tape at VaynerMedia's beautiful office in NYC. If you'd like to see our oh-so-pretty faces and how the interview went down, make sure to check it out. You can find it at our YouTube page at the handle HippoDirect and also at HippoDirect.com slash podcast. And that will be up tomorrow if you're listening to this on release date or it will already be up. So plenty to taste and sip on in this episode. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with the hottest bromance in the wine industry. I'm sure you guys are called that all the time. But John Trouty, Trout Monster Troutman, and Nate Schroeder from Empathy Wines. And we are here at VaynerMedia. You might recognize that name. How the heck are you guys doing today? Doing very good. Thanks for having us. It's actually John Troutman's birthday today, too. It is. Oh, happy yeah. birthday. Thank you. Can't think of a better way to celebrate and start the day. Yes, this is... We actually... It's all of our guest birthdays whenever we have an interview. So it's just... Thank God I, I would have to leave. Very strategic but, of you. <laughs> hey, yeah, it is. Well, happy birthday. I think this is... you know, Ever since you were a little kid, you wanted to grow up and have your birthday and celebrate with this specific podcast interview. <laughs> so this is really a dream come true for all of us. But let's... Uh, we're going to get into a ton about Empathy Wines and where this baby formed and how you guys are disrupting. And But before we get into that, question for each of you. We'll start with you, birthday boy. Why do you like wine? Whew, huge question. Um, it's actually a question I've asked myself a lot because like, it's not even necessarily so much the... Uh, I mean, I love the the taste and the you know complexity and pairing it with food and all that, but it's probably more uh, the holistic, like people behind it, the places that it comes from, the cultural aspect of it. So it goes a lot deeper than just like, it tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the basis of the company. It was just, this tastes good. So we just got to yeah. let it go crazy. Yeah. yeah. That, it does taste good. So yeah, for everybody right, well, listening, they can feel really good about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How about you, Nate? I like it because Trouty likes it. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> hey, anything would, for the birthday yeah, boy. I was actually thinking about this a bit recently too. I grew up playing golf and golf is actually a sport that you can never really master. There's just everything. Nice pun. Yeah. Every round is different. Things change and evolve over time. You can never learn everything about it. Uh, and I actually think there's a lot of parallels to wine in that sense. We were talking, we did a wine tasting the other week, and there's just so much out there about wine. You can never truly know everything. So it's kind of this like uh, journey that you take yourself through and your palate develops, and it's just very interesting. It is, and it tastes good. It's, and, <laughs> and, it tastes, and it tastes good. good. Yeah, that's going to be a quote. We're going to put it on a billboard and everything. <laughs> empathy, well, empathy wines, it tastes good. Empathy wines, it tastes good. So I'm curious for each of you guys. So I know you guys have ties to... Gary V and Vayner going way back, you know, when you were, when you were toddlers, just first tasting one. <laughs> no, but, but really you've, you've spent several years, uh, learning from Gary and being part of this Vayner media family and has ultimately led to this amazing thing you're doing with empathy wines. So before we get into the latest and greatest of the grapes with empathy wines, we'll start with you, John, how did you get connected with Gary in the first place and how did you hear about him? Yeah. You know, having a great bromance that Nate and I have uh, <laughs> will probably sound a little bit like a parrot when we describe our, our respective stories because they're really similar. Mm -hmm. 
but my path to finding Gary was um, I was studying with the Court of Master Sommeliers, which is like an organization that uh, is for anybody who works in restaurants that wants to learn a lot about wine and ultimately to get certified to become a sommelier. Uh, and one late night after working a shift at a restaurant, I was searching how to train your palate uh, in order to taste wine better uh, and stumbled across a whole lot of videos of this crazy guy in New Jersey who would set up a camera every day and taste wines on the internet in yep. the earliest days of YouTube. And I'll spare you all the all the details, but after a couple Twitter messages to him and a couple of emails later, uh, I ultimately ended up meeting him a few months later at the Boston Wine Expo hmm. and pretty much sight unseen said, hey, if you ever have jobs open, let me know. Uh, and a couple months later, I picked up and moved to New York and didn't really know what I was going to be doing for him. Uh, but I first worked at a, a wine social network called Corked with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a little over 10 years ago today. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you're just swimming in the pool of wine by this point. Yeah. And Nate, so you mentioned, I mean, I'm all for parrots, but yeah. still, you mentioned you guys' story is similar, at least how you first got connected. Yep. So what is different about your story versus how Trouty met Gary B? Different would be Trouty met Gary in person and said, I want to work for you. I sent him an email and Ooh. said, I want to work for you. Ooh, trendy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, uh, I interned for Gary at Wine Library um, a year before Cork started. Um, and then I did another internship, with, which is where I met John at Court uh, for Gary. And then, you know, we both kind of just followed him as his career evolved and developed and he started VaynerMedia. But other than that, pretty parrot-like. <laughs> <laughs> it all goes back to the parrots. Yeah. Shout out to Ken Sam as well. Anyway. I want to, believe it or not, talk about wine and empathy wines. If you guys are okay with it, you probably, I don't know if you've ever had wine in your life, but so empathy wines, you guys have created a monster and it's still very, very early in the life of empathy wines, but you have had a hell of a start and you have such a disruptive approach and unique approach, especially for the wine industry that goes back so many years. I mean, I don't, you know, you can tell I'm not, oh, yeah, I didn't invent wine, so I don't know when it was first around. But anyway, it goes back a long time, and you guys are adding so many new ideas to this world. So to start off here, where did this baby of an idea for Empathy Wines come from in the first place? When did you know that you were actually going to start a direct-to-consumer wine company? Yeah, I think it's been quite a few years in the making. You know, Gary... We worked at both John and I worked at Vayner Media for about seven, eight years full time, and Gary knew the whole time that you know we didn't want to work at an agency forever uh, with our wine backgrounds, and he knew the passion that we had for wine. That you know eventually starting a brand together would be a very cool thing for us three with our relationship, yeah. And you know probably start doing something in the wine world makes a ton of sense. <laughs> um, meanwhile, we saw at Vayner Media that. Um, that works with all these CPG, huge CPG companies that all of these DTC brands were starting to pop up and taking a little bit of market share and really getting on the radar of these huge companies. And so we hired a ton of smart people at VaynerMedia that knew how to build a thousand person international agency better than we did. <laughs> um, and I think we were just sharing a glass of wine and we're like, let's do it. You know, it was a very kind of easy, logical conversation at the time. So this is a really organic way to really start something is to you guys literally came up with the idea or at least agreed upon the idea over wine. That's how it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was a kernel of an idea. We spent a lot of time then doing a tons of homework. I think as yeah. much as, you know, we knew a lot about the industry and, and a lot about, you know, um, e-commerce marketing. We, we spent several months in the upfront figuring out what the exact model was, uh, before diving headfirst into it. So did you guys pitch this to Gary or was he in from the beginning? How did that whole dynamic work out? You know, it's <laughs> funny. And, uh, it wasn't that long ago. And yet I don't know if I could tell you an exact moment when we all landed <laughs> on like, hey, we're doing this and this is how it's going to work. Uh, Too much wine, there might have been a couple of glasses of wine involved. But yeah. it was definitely a few conversations. I think we kind of broached the idea, you know, before we knew it was we were really ready to go all in on it and mm -hmm. kind of seeded the idea. And then I think, you know, it was probably two or three other dinners later that we're like, okay, let's do this. Gotcha. Yes. So you really, you wind and dined. Gary. Yeah, we, we wind and dined Gary. Hey, it's effective still yeah, to this yeah. day, huh? So how did you decide to go the direct-to-consumer route and have such a 
digital brand from that side versus say, hey, what if we try to start our own vineyard or partner with another, you know, just one yeah. other vineyard? Yeah. So I think direct to consumer has become such a, you know, a buzzword these days. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's in no way, shape, or form are we romantic about e commerce marketing. You are romantic, though. We are, are romantic. Yeah. yeah, always. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard romantic before. That's this good. much is obvious. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna, hold on. Let me trademark that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we started first with uh, the consumer, which is really how any brand should start, in my opinion, uh, where it's how do you provide the most value to them? Um, and for wine, we recognized that there was a real gap in the market with the consumer. So they've been mm. forced for pretty much the, the earliest stages of wine sales in the United States to what we think is overpay for wine. And also the wine that they're buying doesn't have a story behind it often. Yeah. Uh, and so for us, we said, how do we provide the best quality wine at the lowest possible price while also making a really authentic product? So that was like kind of the, the beginning of it. And then it just so happened to be that selling direct to consumer was the path to achieve that. Mm. Yeah. And so what about empathy? I mean, it's a, such a powerful word. I mean, and you see it everywhere now, but it's got such a positive and strong connotation. And it's really something that people strive to focus on. So how did you guys decide that name? And what does empathy mean to you? This, it's funny, like the, the formation of this business, we, we should have documented these things a little bit more. It really wasn't much of a... <laughs> this is why we're here. <laughs> yeah, it really wasn't much of a... You know, I think we played around with a few different names. Uh, we probably had three or four names floating around that all kind of tangentially tied to Gary's brand. You know, we we want this brand to kind of transcend Gary, but, you know, obviously as him being one of the, the co-founders in the business and his brand and how big he is these days and what he talks about, uh, having something tangentially tied to what he talks about was really important for us. Yeah. So. Uh, he speaks about empathy in business all the time and how he thinks that empathy is a superpower uh, for people to have, especially as they're building a business and growing the business. And what was awesome for us being, you know, a direct to consumer winery and partnering with a lot of amazing farmers in the Northern California area, you know, on the back of all of our bottles, it says empathy for the farmer, empathy for you. And mm -hmm. so for us, it's, you know, really telling the stories of these farmers and helping to build their brand and being almost, you know, a part of their team in some way. While empathy for you getting the customer the best bottle of wine that we can for the price. And you guys do like if you check your website, I'm just empathywines.com, correct? Yep. If you check your website, good. I was like <laughs> practicing, I was practicing that over and over again. Um, if you go to your website, you really just by, you know, after you fill in your birth date, of course, just by taking a few seconds, you really get such an amazing understanding of your brand and the story behind it. And I think what's so cool about what you guys do is you obviously celebrate the consumer and try to make it as easy and as minimal friction as possible for the consumer that's ultimately buying the wine. But you guys also celebrate the farmers and you celebrate these winemakers that you partner with. So how, how did that come about that you figured out it was important not just to focus on the front end and the public side of things, but also the actual grapes and where this comes from in the first place? Yeah, I think, um, you know, even removing ourselves from wine and just looking at, you know, food and beverage in general, mm -hmm. more and more consumers are actually starting to care about where their source comes from. Um, and so on top of that, we looked at wine as a category then and realized that um, outside of it, like the very, very high end levels, you don't really hear much about the farmers, the people who actually frankly, are the most important part of the equation to making a really Ooh, good shots one. Fired. Uh, <laughs> um, and then two are the people who are kind of like the heart and soul behind every glass of wine you have. Yeah. Um, and so for us, we thought it was an awesome opportunity to spotlight some great growers in California. And rather than going to like the regions that everybody knows about, Napa, Sonoma, um, we said, how do we spotlight some up and coming regions and places that we're really excited about that are turning out awesome wines and trying to spotlight on those guys? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, would, I mean, I think authenticity matters in business. I would and, say so, yeah. and especially when we're trying to build, you know, a digital, you know, a digital first winery, we're building the brand digitally. Mm -hmm. Storytelling matters. And so to tell the story that we wanted to tell, you know, we have to make our own wine tell the stories of these farmers, show the kind of whole process that gets this bottle on a table. So that was important to us. 
And so you've done that digital storytelling, we'll call it. You've done that in a number of ways and you've had an amazing launch and a lot of it, of course, you know, partnering with Gary and Gary being a part of it, his influence. I mean, you speak, there's an amazing level at that, but also you've partnered with other influencers and you've done so much. I'm sure you've done some paid stuff, but you've done a lot of stuff organically as well. So in this digital storytelling realm, what would you say has been of the different tactics or approaches that you've used? What do you think has been the most impactful in your first year here? Great question. So, you know, it's funny. We've, I think we've done a a solid job so far of doing <laughs> brand like, storytelling and like, you know, uh, with our digital content, but very honest, I think we've only just begun. Um, mm -hmm. Like we're, you know, we're sitting here at VaynerMedia and we're able to tap some awesome minds, um, but our team is really small. And so it's really only been since bringing on Jake behind the camera over here and shout out Jake. Yeah. And our team's starting hey, to grow. Hey Jake. Uh, <laughs> to really ramp up those efforts um, and be able to take what is right now, maybe like, 10 to 60. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think, but from like, a what's been most impactful and the things we've done so far, you know, influencer marketing is it's again, such a, another buzzword. Yeah. Um, but for us, it's been incredibly impactful. Um, and it's probably a, a place where there's a huge area of opportunity for brands. Um, even still, yeah. I think we'll probably get back to influencer marketing and talk more about that, but, Ooh, foreshadowing. uh, the, I mean, the most impactful thing so far has been Gary, right? Um, no. <laughs> but so, yeah. I mean, Gary said it a few times as we started this business that this is kind of to date a culmination of his life's work. He spent, yeah. you know, 10, 15 years building Wine Library and building his personal brand through wine. And then he started this digital advertising agency and built that up to, you know, 800 people and five offices or whatever it is now. And so marrying those two things together, you know, we're, you know, we kind of birthed the digital first winery. And so we knew that Gary was going to be kind of the biggest yeah. um, factor in the first eight to 10 months. And then our mission going forward is building it in parallel with Gary and really starting to tell these stories in a, in a big way. And it's smart. I mean, it would be silly for you guys, it's especially I know you guys both used to work in his office as well. And being so close in this trio bromance now, <laughs> when we include him in, but Obviously, he he is just a dream influencer. He's a dream business partner and a dream influencer from the wine side of things and the business side of things and marketing side mm -hmm. of things. I think he knows a couple things about marketing. But in terms of the consumer facing side of things and how Gary has promoted Empathy Wine and told the stories, what do you think has been the biggest impact to your business? Like, is it the live streaming? Is it when he, you know, does giveaways or you guys do the barter thing where you, you know, trade and offer the four D's, you know, what on the Gary side of things, what can you point to that's been most powerful? You know, honestly, the live streaming stuff is incredible for a couple of different reasons. I think one, it's super impactful for sales, um, which is great, right? Like that's, obvious for any business that's selling selling wine to be able to see a huge uptick in sales simply by like flipping on instagram live mm -hmm. um, but the reason why i like it so much is the brand side of things and the opportunity it presents like it's all of a sudden in a very short period of time you have a captured audience and a chance to tell them about what makes our wine special and unique mm -hmm. um, especially for an audience who might not be the most passionate wine drinkers like Yes, Gary still has legacy fans who are fans of his from the, the wine Day days. One, yeah. yeah. But a lot of these people are, you know, entrepreneurs, they're, you know, business startup people. They might not necessarily love wine, but if they can use that as an opportunity to learn a little bit more about the product and what makes us unique, um, that's, that's huge for us. Yeah. And on the flip side of things, uh, we've talked a lot about the positives, but do you guys know extremely well, especially first year in the business? I mean, it is incredibly hard to launch a new brand and to launch a new business, especially when it's something that is in an industry that is so historic and traditional and you're doing something new. What would you say? And I want to hear from each of you individually. What would you say has been the toughest part in these these early days of Empathy Wine? You know my answer. Um, <laughs> Are you guys going to pair it again? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think so. Not on this one. I'll try to give you a different um, answer. Yeah, so. Perfect. <laughs> like, as you said, the, the wine industry is a pretty old industry and, and antiquated. And some of the 
compliance and regulations to start a winery um, kind of are, are based in very old laws. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very fragmented system. You know, there's federal regulations. Every state has different compliance and different um, licenses. And so the whole process to kind of get this business up and running from a regulatory standpoint took almost exactly a year. Oh um, my God. Yeah, it's a pretty high barrier to entry to do it how we're doing it. You know, we're shipping to 43 states um, and we went right out of the <laughs> gate shipping to every single state that we could. But every state has different regulations within that state. And so we knew going into it that it was a regulated business. You know, we're, we're shipping alcohol across state lines, so we're not naive to that fact. But right. once you really get in a business like this, uh, you understand the complexities and the how long it takes to actually get things done. So did you heavily research the old days of bootleggers and prohibition <laughs> just to prepare for this? Well, a no. lot of, I mean, a lot of the, the laws and uh, distribution stems from post prohibition laws that are yeah. still in place. And so the laws have been opening up for wineries to ship direct over the past five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I think 10 years ago we could only ship to maybe 35 States and now it's 43. So things are definitely moving and, uh, a good direction for wineries. Um, but yeah, a lot of the laws are based in kind of, you know, 1930s, 1940s. Right. Um, yeah. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who, who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. How about you, Traddy? So, you know, I'll give you another response that's specific to wine. And so it's, okay. you know, going into, <laughs> going into this business, I think we knew it's a really challenging industry from a number of angles um, there's actually a joke in the wine industry where if you meet anybody who owns a winery or is deep in it, it goes along the lines of how do you make a small fortune in the wine industry? You start with a really, really big one. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's because when you take a step back and you realize that good wines and authentically made wines, like the path that we're going down, it's an interesting model. You have to buy grapes up front. Mm -hmm. You then have to crush those grapes and turn it into wine. It then needs to age in really, really high quality, expensive barrels. Uh, that wine then goes into bottle and then eventually you end up distributing it to consumers. And so when you think about it from a cash flow standpoint, there's a lot of upfront costs and investment, um, including our model where we incur all the shipping costs to ship it to you. And so yeah. thank you, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our pleasure. <laughs> um, and really nice. Of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to, to get a really good quality bottle of wine to your doorstep, there's a lot of upfront costs involved, which it gives you a whole newfound appreciation for when you're actually in it. Well, that's one of my favorite things about you guys is, as you're just saying, it's so complex and the behind the scenes is so intricate, but you've taken a model that from the consumer's view of things, it's so simple and it's mm -hmm. so easy and straightforward. So you've absolutely nailed it from the convenience standpoint and the quality standpoint as well. And so I want to, I'm curious about that part of things. So if you look at your different offerings, you have three types of wines, you have white, you have rosé, you have red, and it's as simple as that. And you partner with group of different farmers on that or winemakers. So there's so many wine enthusiasts and people that are, you know, take so much pride in collecting specific types of wine and this specific wine or this specific wine. How did you guys decide to make the ultimate consumer offering so simple and concise? Yeah. So I think for us, it was, um, not going after the subset of consumer you just described, right? There are some people <laughs> who are, super passionate wine collectors and they might know a you know a very particular style that they want to buy and that's ultimately not going to be who we go after mm -hmm. instead what we're going after is somebody who wants a super consistent super high quality super value oriented wine that is and this is going to sound ridiculous but it's just delicious <laughs> like it's funny if you taste a lot of wine out there including wines that are super popular mm -hmm. and if you were to just throw a, bl a blindfold on somebody and say taste this they would be like i don't really like that do you know what i mean and for yeah. us it was how do we find the intersection between a really good high quality like wine that has an integrity which sounds kind of corny but something that you yeah. would pour for a wine professional or a sommelier or whoever and they would say wow that's really high quality really well made but then at the same token, like you could pour it for your grandmother and she'd be like, oh, that's delicious, you know? And so <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that was kind of the, the merger between two things that we were, we were going after. And it, 
it landed on kind of three simple blends that we're allowed to yeah. to make year over year. Yeah. And the, the blends were very intentional for us. It, it gives us flexibility year over year to contract the best grapes that we can. You know, this year we, we brought on, or for the next vintage, we brought on a new farmer who's, we really believes in our mission, understands what we're doing, wants to be a part of it. And um, we're like pumped to tell his story too. And Shout so, out Tom Merwin. Uh, shout out Tom. Shout out Tom. So <laughs> it gives us this flexibility year over year to make the best wine possible that we can. Um, and we're not kind of beholden to, to a specific varietal. Mm, spoken with true integrity, both of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> So that kind of, you kind of alludes to the next thing I was wondering about. So let's, let's sort of wrap up this empathy piece with of the things you guys are working on now, or like the new, 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 newer developments, things that you're planning to roll out soon. And you don't need to reveal anything you don't want to, but also don't mind if you do. Uh, <laughs> what, what are you most excited about with empathy as you, as you really hit your stride and go into year two and beyond? So... I'll keep it broad based, but text is something we're super yeah. excited about. Mm -hmm. I think uh, from a marketing standpoint, uh, there's just so much opportunity to use text as a platform, both for storytelling as well as to just drive performance. It's almost like email marketing in the early days. People, yeah. the open rates that you get on texting and, and consumer engagement there is super high. So something we'll be, we'll be doing a lot of in the coming year. So it's funny you said that, you know, Empathy Wines has been a rocket ship over the first eight <laughs> months. And, you know, I think we've done a really good job. But I think John said it earlier of going from like 10 to 60. We uh, we're launching a new website uh, next week. Oh. So the website will look completely different, which we're pumped about. And we're really going to start, you know, turning on the faucet in terms of marketing, in terms of mm -hmm. building the brand. Uh, again, in parallel with Gary, not using Gary for everything. Right. And so I'm really excited to see you know, the content that we're producing right now, the new website and kind of how that's going to continue to build the brand. Perfect. And what is, and I'm assuming same URL, same domain name. Yeah. All the same. What is different and about this new website that you're most excited about? Um, I think it tells our story a lot cleaner. Um, we're changing. This is some, some breaking news. Breaking news. Ooh. We're, uh -oh. yeah, <laughs> we're, we're Hot take. We're changing the pricing model slightly. Ooh. Um, again, to help, have our story be a lot more clear for the customer. So right now, you know, it, the price scales as you buy more or scales down as you buy more. Yeah. Um, so we're changing it to, it's going to be $20 a bottle for everything. And there's going to be flat oh. rate shipping for three and six and then free shipping for 12. Um, just because, you know, it's just a much clearer thing. You know, we're trying to make a $20 bottle of wine that would cost you 35 or 40 in your yeah. local liquor store. Um, and then we're also going to be giving a, a little bit of a discount for all our subscription members, um, which is a little bit different than what's going on now. So cleaner. Um, and I think that it will be much more customer friendly. Well, congrats on the new news. Yeah, that is amazing. It's so cool that you have such a focus on quality and these are really, really good wines and you're still able to provide them to consumers at such an amazing price. And at the same time, you're championing the farmers and winemakers, everybody on the back end of it. So you guys have got quite the mix, quite the, quite the yes. wine mix here. So you finally decide to start a podcast. Congrats. You've never been more excited. But wait a sec. You quickly find out this is way more of a time commitment than you initially thought. You're going to need someone that has you covered behind the scenes. That's where I come in. Email me at max at hippodirect.com and let's get wild. Let's switch gears a little bit. We're going to get to a section on inspiration and creativity. So dive deeper into your minds a little bit. See how you stay creative, the people that inspire you, and the things that you're interested in. So we'll start with you this time, Nate. What do you do to stay creative? Oh, wow. So you're talking to the numbers person in the, uh, in the business. <laughs> Play with the calculator. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, go, I go deep into Excel sheets and come up with formulas. Um, <laughs> You know, I think it's just consuming content. Um, it's, you know, being on Twitter and Instagram and looking at what's working in the marketplace and mm -hmm. how can we take inspiration from, you know, things that are working and how do we put empathy zone spin on it. So, you know, I just keep my eyes open and see what's going on in the market and tr try and take that and not fast follow, but 
just make sure what we're doing fits in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. What are your favorite ways to consume information like that? Just scrolling. <laughs> uh, you know, Twitter? Do you do like I'm, lists I'm, or anything? Or you have a strategic approach to Twitter, or is it literally you just keep your mind open? See, what... I, I, I've you know curated who I follow over the years pretty yeah. well. So I'm a little bit of a Twitter guy over Instagram. Yeah, um, yeah you are. Yeah. I like that about you. Yeah, I, it's so much more conversational. It's that's, very that's conversational. It. It's yeah. it's very like real time and breaking, mm -hmm. um, which I think you can kind of stay up on on current things a little bit quicker. Oh, totally. Uh, um, so that's what I do. It's nothing nothing too crazy. How about you? My answer might be broad, but it's just spend time with people and f go out of my way to like interact. <laughs> well, with Well, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah, ex yeah, exactly. But in all seriousness, it's just like, I, I think people fuel creativity. Um, and I would include like traveling to different places and experiencing different cultures. And um, I know that's a very like pie in the sky answer, but again, I, and I don't think anybody outside of creatives labels themselves as the most creative person. Except me. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, you, of course you are. Um, You're a unicorn. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, mean, I was just trying to hide that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just spending time with people, interacting with lots of people, learning from them, keeping an open mind. And I think that's a yeah. super important point because when you like take somebody who's a business contact, for example, you have a coffee meeting for that. Sometimes it, it turns from, you think it's going to be a half hour meeting or breakfast with somebody and then it turns into two hour conversation. Like you never know where any conversation is going to lead. But why do you think that is? Why do you think that feeding off other people is such a creative boost? I think, and this is getting very, very philosophical, but I actually think that's like <laughs> what humanity is, right? Like we're born as people that uh, inherently want to interact with one another. Um, and so I think that's what fuels innovation. That's what fuels exploration it's what motivates people is spending time with one another for most um and so i think john's a big extrovert uh, yeah yeah i'm an extrovert <laughs> so put me in a room with people and i want to go talk to them perfect yeah well thank you good, good thing we're doing this uh <laughs> when you think of the empathy side of things and you think about the ideas that you guys and your team have come up with that you've gone all in on and really paid off for you what's that dynamic like between you two and between the rest of your team, how does it work when somebody has an idea and you decide to actually pursue something versus just, oh, these are just ideas over wine and then maybe we forget about them? Yeah, so I mean, for the first six, eight months of the business, it was me, John, and Nora and Gary. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, our, again, our business model was very simple at the start. It was three wines. It was, you know, trying to sell as much subscription as possible. Um, but we definitely tried some stuff early on and proposed some um, partnerships and are continuing to for for us coming from the the Gary Vaynerchuk school of marketing and Vayner media you know we want to build a culture that's just simply like doing and trying yeah um and so we both come from that that place where it's much better to just go in on something and try it and see what happens than talk about it for 2 weeks um <laughs> so you know, we, we pitched an idea with the can wine. Um, and I think two weeks later we had like a prototype of a can wine and a deck ready to go. And so it's just, let's do, do, do. And then, f you know, if things don't work great and we'll try something else. And, and I think that's how it's always going to be. Yeah. So what would you say is the biggest lesson? It could be from Gary or could it be from being part of Vayner media for so many years as a whole. What do you think is the biggest thing that you've learned that you found the most valuable? Like if you had to pick one lesson, really put you on the spot here. Yeah. And not to just echo what Nate just said, but like really build to a echo what Nate just said. Yeah, <laughs> no. But just a, a lot a, of parrots in this room. I don't know what's a lot going of, on. Yeah, you guys got a problem with that yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just like doing things. So I think to Nate's point, people yeah. tend to overthink things, especially when they're you know starting a business. Like how do we make sure we're being as strategic as possible? Um, and very honestly, at a personal level, I had to like break myself back into that mindset going from a big organization that VaynerMedia had turned into, you know, with 900 people at a certain point, a business gets so big that it's really hard to just go do things without, you know, having huge conference room meetings beforehand and, you know, yeah. thinking things through. I think that's actually been probably the most refreshing thing about empathy is like between, you know, a really small team and just building a culture of like, yeah, let's try it. 
um it's mm-hmm. been great that's been probably the thing that's you guys really nailed the glass half full thing and so <laughs> which i feel is important to your yeah. brand i think my answer would be it's weird because this this in the wine industry is a very you know nostalgic and romantic industry but i think yeah. not being romantic about the past mm-hmm. that's kind of how vayner media built mm. its business of not not doing what others were doing you know 12 months ago just because of just because it's what people are doing it's looking forward and so for us in the wine industry, you know, we're making three wines this year. They're all blends. If we see a, a huge trend that makes tons of sense for our business and our brand, we're not opposed to trying it um, and going for it. So while, while we like our business model and we're going to continue to really push a ton into that, it's something that, you know, it's a business. Things change. We pivot. We find a really good idea. We go in on it. And so it's just not being romantic about the past to build the future business that's fascinating to me and and i mentioned your guys bromance and i I say it jokingly but also there's a serious aspect (laughs) as well but it's so unique that you guys are in this romantic industry taking a non-romantic approach Mm -hmm. so you guys are really out of the box with that i love that and what do you guys do what do you like to do outside of work. So when you're not focused on empathy, which I'm sure you probably feel like you haven't slept over the past <laughs> couple of years and you're constantly thinking about things, but what do you like to do outside of things? In addition to, you know, going into random rooms and talking to people, I take Trouty to gla- get glasses of wine and <laughs> <laughs> it's very cute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Light candles. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I play golf on the weekends sometimes, which is nice. Uh, New York's uh, challenging uh, um, weather-wise to do that year-round. Mm-hmm. But I play golf, go eat good food, um, and then just work. When I'm not working on wine, I'm usually drinking it. Uh, <laughs> so that I like. I like to play golf with Nate. Uh, <laughs> I could have saw that. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. I'm not nearly as good, but I try. I like to spend time with my girlfriend. I like to explore New York. I don't know. Those are Those are the things that... Yeah, keep me busy. Is this fun? I like to fun spend time with my girlfriend too. <laughs> oh, perfect! I, I need to throw that in there. <laughs> while, while we're on this topic, <laughs> shout out yeah. Tess. <laughs> shout out Tess. Yeah. While we're on this topic, I like to spend time with my girlfriend Dana as well. So, <laughs> shout out Dana. All on the same page. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's get to a fan favorite segment. Uh, there's going to be billboards about this too. Fan favorite segment called the Wild Business Shout Out of the Week. The Wild Business Shout Out of the Week. <laughs> wild business shout out of the week this is where we talk about a recent campaign or, or trend something that caught our attention and you guys are so so in this marketing and entrepreneurship space that i'm fascinated to hear what you guys have to hear but you kind of alluded to some influencer stuff earlier you guys want to talk about that for a little bit yeah so we're really diving in we we started uh we shipped our rosé in march and we sent a bottle of our rosé to about 400 influencers, not asking for anything. You know, mm-hmm. they were, most of them were fans of Gary's. We just wanted to get it into, into their hands and have them try it. And so we're going to go a lot heavier into influencer marketing over the next six months. We see it as not only a, a distribution, a way to get really good distribution, but to continue to be, become more culturally relevant, which is important for us. And so we're really looking into the models of like, um, co-watches and bang energy and ignite yeah and how do we build uh empathy's version of that in a really authentic way i think people can be a little bit not jaded but when they look at those campaigns you know it it seems a little forced at some times but how do we do it in a really authentic value add way to these influencers Mm, yeah trouty to you what stands out about this influencer marketing that is most appealing to you yeah, I think um, so. I think to Nate's point is, you know, when you look at a lot of brands and what their approach to influencer marketing was in like the earlier days of you know, Instagram and other social platforms, it was how do I get as much scale as possible and work with the influencers that have a mass following, so five hundred thousand, five million, ten mm-hmm. million followers. You're talking about me, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Guys like yourself, Thank you. um, <laughs> get the product in their hands and then let them just share in any way, shape or form. And to Nate's point, like consumers are smarter than I think marketers oftentimes give them credit for. Um, Mm -hmm. And so while that maybe worked in the very, very early days, after a while it got so commercial um, that it just became overtly commercial. And so for us, it was 
how do we take a step back and rethink what that means? Um, and in many cases, it might be building communities and almost like an ambassador program of people who genuinely love and stand mm. behind your product um, rather than just going to Kylie Jenner or whoever it is. To, <laughs> yeah. Although, she, she'll, although she'll I'd be, love to get podcast, Kylie so, some yeah. rosette. If she wants to be an empathy <laughs> ambassador, she's welcome. Um, yeah, yeah Kylie, for, do you have a quote for no, <laughs> And for, for us, you know, we did that kind of early influencer lightweight and we really f- realized that to make it successful, they have to kind of be somewhat invested in your brand. You know, a story on Instagram as a one-off doesn't build too much awareness or mm-hmm. really sell products. So we need to, well, I think what's exciting us about the influencer side of things is building a lasting partnership with, you know, 200 to 500, however mm-hmm. many it turns out to be, um, that stick with us for, for the year. Mm-hmm. And it's a continuous push from the influencer side. That's what's mm-hmm. really exciting. Instead of just like a one-off influencer yeah. play that you might get a bump in sales one day, how do we create a program that's sustainable? And yeah, I think it's a really good way to go about it. And, and this influencer space is growing like crazy. And, you know, these social platforms aren't getting smaller. So on the side of somebody who is seeking influencers or looking to, you know, dip their toe in, in the wine pool of influencer marketing, how do you guys plan to go about it and reach out to these influencers? What advice can you share from that regard? Obviously, it helps to have connections. But as far as the actual message that you do when you pitch them on this or send them stuff. How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. We're, I mean, we're working on developing the program as we speak. We have the very fortunate uh, circumstance mm-hmm. of having Gary behind the business. Oh, and, you do? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, you know, I, he has a pretty large database now of influencers that follow him that are interested in our product project it has to be. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I think we have it a little bit easier, but we are, you know, putting together kind of a pitch deck, uh, of sorts and sending it over to them of what this looks like, what we're kind of asking, what they'll get, gotcha. you know, we're DMing them. Hey, you know, this is Nate from empathy wines working with Gary really like love your profile. We're doing this program check. Like we're going to send you an email, check this out. Um, so I think for people trying to do it on their own, it's identifying who fits your brand, mm-hmm. you know, um, and how can you, whether fiscally or in other value, really provide value to to them that makes them want to stick with you for that year and it's incredible because it's not just i mean instagram dms we know can be super powerful from a networking tool Mm -hmm. and a business tool but from what you're saying like it's clearly not just a random dm or you know take a few minutes and dm somebody like it's clearly thought out here and you have you even have a pitch deck for it you're so prepared yeah i think if you want to get a one-off like hey you know can you post this we'll give you 500 bucks or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I think that can probably be done pretty quickly. But if you want to develop a relationship with these people and mm-hmm. have them be an ambassador and spokesperson more right. or less for your brand, like you need to come to them with, you know, what are they getting? How is this valuable? How can we add value to them? Perfect. So what I'm going to do right after this interview, I'm going to DM Kylie and <laughs> offer her $500. Yeah. And I'm sure that will work. I think that you'll get that. You'll get that 5 million followers quick. Yeah, perfect. Well, this is the interview that changed it all. <laughs> so let's get to a unusual segment called the unusual. And so this might sound unusual. I'm just going to say unusual as much as possible. This might sound sound kind of funny or weird, but it's fascinating to dive into the minds of entrepreneurs and co-founders like you guys and see what is it about your personality that's a little bit quirkier, a little bit different, and it's it's who you are. So the first question here, we'll start with you, John. And yeah, that's a hell of a sigh. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with you. What is your biggest pet peeve? Um, messiness. I uh, am fairly obsessive compulsive, especially mm-hmm. about my home. And so if things are out of place, <laughs> uh, it gives me, yeah, it gives me a little anxiety. I'm, I'm actually, I'm the exact same way. Like I, I can't have a piece of paper even tilted a little bit with it. Yeah. 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 That's, that's for me. That's my pet peeve is things out of place. <laughs> How about you, Nate? So you're incredibly messy. I'm just no, <laughs> I, well to, to continue the bromance story, I lived with John for three years. Of course. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we could have done this at your old place. We could have. And, uh, he actually made me a lot cleaner person there over the three years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Real impact. You know, I don't really have too many pet peeves. Nate's like the most <laughs> easygoing person. Oh, right yeah. Now. Yeah. For, I mean, living in New York for eight years now, I don't like slow walkers. That's oh, a big man. one. 
That's a big one. I mean, but, I, I experienced like seven <laughs> on the walk over yeah. here today. So I, I like to live my life fairly efficiently and slow walkers just kind of slow golfers, slow yeah. golfers. Ooh. Yeah. So everything's <laughs> slow. So you're go, yeah. go, go. How about quirks? Start with you, Nate, this time. What's something about your personality that your girlfriend, shout out Tess, or your bromance slash former roommate <laughs> call, calls you out on that's a little bit quirky about your personality, but it's part of who you are and you're not going to change that. I think I'm just a very sarcastic person. Are you? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if that's a quirk, but that's just a personality trait that, yeah. that I get called out on from time to time. It's hard to turn off. Then. It is hard to turn off. Yeah. I'm like the most normal person you'll ever meet. I have no clue. Okay. No, you, can, you, can't, you can't say that with a straight face <laughs> yeah. and then expect everybody uh, to go along with it. <laughs> Nate, answer the question for me. What makes me quirky? I'm like, I'm, quirky? I wish I was more self-aware that I could come up with something. John loves singing in the car. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do like that. Yeah. 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 Do you like singing? Do you sing in the office? Do you sing? I'm not a good singer. But you yeah, just like yeah. singing in the car? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, singing, we'll, we'll, we'll singing poorly in we'll the car. We'll have to hear it to believe it. But <laughs> singing. Okay. And then it kind of parallels to the next question, weird talents. Is there something, and then I'm not going to let you say singing, not that you're good at it, but <laughs> is there something that you are really, really good at, but it really, it doesn't have an effect on your business. It's just something, and it could be something completely random. Like it could be a memory thing. It could be, you know, tying your shoes super fast, like whatever. That'd be a cool talent, tying your shoes super fast. Yeah. I just invented yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that would be helpful. Uh, dig deep here you can go yeah, first yeah. i would say want. throw golf aside because i think everyone thinks they're a very good ping pong player i think i'm a I very as well. <laughs> i think i'm a very good ping pong player mm -hmm. and so i'll challenge your community to a ping pong game um <laughs> <laughs> let's do it we'll yeah. make it happen yeah so i'm like very moderate at a lot of things <laughs> rather than being a master of anyone. John's, John's very normal and very moderate. Yeah, very normal. This is moderate. a fantastic interview. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got, you know, I got nothing. I, I, John's a very good palate. You know, yeah. yeah. Blind taste wine very well. Yeah, I can gotcha. blind taste wine well. That's, I guess that's a skill. <laughs> but that has to do with the. The yeah. winery, so that yeah. doesn't gotcha. really count. Yeah. All right. Well, it, well I'm we'll, letting you down. We'll, here. we'll give it to you. We'll do a follow up. Yeah. yeah. Right. Really just start recording yeah. over and over. No. <laughs> uh, uh, I know. We'll what, give it to you. Coffee. I'm good at tasting coffee. You're good at well. taste. Yeah. So not just wine. You're, not you just, taste everything. Yeah. Taste everything. Just a great palate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the human palate. Discerning palate. The palate and the parrot. There we go. <laughs> All right. We only got a little bit of time left. I know you guys got to run here soon. I'd love to wrap up with some quick rapid fire Q and A. You ready for it? Bring it. All right. Let's get wild. What is, and you got to shout it out first, whoever thinks of it first. What's your favorite blend of wine to taste personally? Champagne. Champagne. Romance. Yeah. What is, if you could only listen to one song on repeat and it had to be the same song for the rest of your life over and over again, oh what song would it be? That's, all, that's a terrible question. But also oh, great. thanks. But also, but also <laughs> great. Jeez. Not terrible, just hard to answer. Yeah. Uh, uh you know what? Billy Joel came to mind. I don't know what song, but I, I really like his That's music. Not a I've song. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I listen to a lot of Billy Joel music. If mm -hmm. I had to pick one, I uh, used to say uh, "Yesterday" by the Beatles, but it's just such a somber song. So yeah. I don't know if I could. I think it could make me sad if I listen to it over it's and so over. So yesterday, yeah, yeah, but I like that. That's a good song. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll all, sing it all in the time car. song. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, you guys need to share a video of all this singing, you know, featuring Paul McCartney. And then last one, if you, you probably saw this coming. If you had to name a cruise ship after you, what would you name that cruise ship? The SS Trouty, because you should always be focusing on your personal brand. Bam. How about you? I mean, how do I follow the SS Trouty up? <laughs> you can name uh, it the SS Trouty Dose. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely name my ship Empathy. Yeah. Oh, it's actually <laughs> wow! Because, there we go. Because I'd rather promote, you know, the empathy brand than my personal. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> as long as you guys offer wine, yeah. at that's actually a good name for a yacht too. Yeah. That would do well. Yeah. All right. The, so the SS empathy. When you guys developed this yacht and cruise ship, it was this interview first <laughs> that it came right. out on. Well, perfect. Thank you guys so much. This has been amazing. I really appreciate you guys hosting me at this amazing office, incredible office. This is still surreal and sharing your story. So. Thank you guys so much. And I, I, I also do want to shout out our mutual buddy, Patrick Fransco, who did the four D's with you guys and set this up in the first yeah. place. So shout out Patrick, my fellow Clevelander and, uh, I magnet management. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. This was yeah. fun.
Of course. And where's the best place for people to connect with you and with Empathy Wines? Empathywines.com, uh, Empathy Wines across social. Uh, and I'm at Trouty on almost every social platform. Yeah, he really got lucky with that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hit me up on Twitter at Nate S. Nate S. Yeah, a, yeah, we'll stick to Twitter for me. Perfect. And then last thing here, stage is yours. Final thoughts. It could be whatever you want. It could be shout out. It could be a quote, a phrase. It could be the whole first verse of yesterday. Whatever you want. Uh, just want to give a shout out to the 2019, 2020 Phoenix Suns team <laughs> with, with their season coming up. That's a podcast I'm, I'm, first. I'm, I'm very looking forward to, to them finishing 10th place in the West and uh, <laughs> staying up till 1 a.m. every morning and watching them lose. It sounds like a dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shout out to me for being my birthday. Yes. Damn that. That's, Absolutely. A bad, that's a bad job by me. <laughs> yeah. And we, we're, we're going to release this a little bit after. So shout out for your belated birthday as yeah. well. But Thank everything. Yes, yes. Just, <laughs> a lot of shout outs here. This was good. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to shout outs. Happy belated birthday, John. And Godspeed to you and the sons, Nate. Thank you guys so much for hosting, and Jake as well. Thank you so much for capturing it all and hosting at the amazing Vayner Media office. And thank you, wild listeners, for tuning into another episode. If you have not already, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast listening destination and leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also slide into our blog and newsletter DMs. Yes, let's imagine that's a thing for a second at hippodirect.com slash blog and hippodirect.com slash newsletter. That blog features bonus content and business growth resources, and that newsletter is the Hippo Digest, and it is your place for wild marketing ideas every single week. And of course, you can throw us a wine emoji and more on your favorite social media channels at the handles Hippo Direct and Max Brandstetter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!